Hello everyone, my name is Ian and you're watching Big Rock Moto. Thank you so much for tuning in today. So a few months ago, I reviewed this bike's smaller cousin, the standard Africa Twin 1100. And I think in my conclusion to that video, I said something to the effect of, that bike was a little bit too much in between the smaller off-road bikes like the Tenere 700 and KTM's 890, those bikes having better off-road ability than the Africa Twin, but it wasn't up to the level of comfort and technology and features of the larger capacity bikes like Yamaha Super Tenere or the BMW R1250 GS or bikes like that. So for me, it fell a little bit too much in between and really didn't have the benefits of either class of bikes. So sitting right here is the 2021 Africa Twin 1100 Adventure Sports ES DCT. ES being electronic suspension, DCT being dual clutch transmission. We'll get into what all that means later. But the question is, this bike with the addition of the larger fuel tank, the adjustable windshield, the heated grips, the electronic suspension, and all the additional tech and features of this bike versus the standard Africa Twin, does that bring it closer to the higher end competition like BMW GS and other bikes in that category? It should be noted that this is one of the only large capacity heavyweight heavy hauler adventure bikes with a 21 inch front wheel. There's just not many choices if you want that off-road friendly 21 inch front wheel and this is one of them. So I guess the big question is with all the additional features and technology of this bike and seeing as it, it's a relatively affordable price point compared to some of those bikes, this coming in just over $17,000, this is finally have what it takes to dethrone bikes like BMW's GS for a great choice for a heavyweight adventure bike. Well, that's what we're here to find out today. So this is gonna be a very comprehensive, complete review, just like I always do. We're gonna go in depth. So stay tuned and uh, let's get started. So to understand where the Adventure Sports model fits in, let's just review the whole Africa Twin lineup real briefly. So all of the new Africa Twin 1100 models use Honda's 1,084cc parallel twin engine. It has a relatively friendly, low compression, 10.1 to one uh, compression ratio, which probably means it's gonna have really good longevity. The engine puts out around 100 horsepower, around 73 kilowatts, and around 77 foot-pound of torque, or around 98 newton meters. All the Africa Twins in the lineup use a 21 inch front wheel and an 18 inch rear wheel, which makes it very friendly for off-road riding, not only in terms of getting over obstacles and bumps, but also great tire choices in that size. All the Africa Twins also have really, really good competitive ground clearance and really long suspension travel. So they're very good at conquering off-road terrain. So the standard Africa Twin, the bike that I reviewed a few months ago, comes in at $14,399 US. And for that price, you get a five gallon fuel tank, a fully adjustable suspension, but manually adjustable. Um, you get a non-adjustable windshield. You get tube wheels instead of the tubeless wheels like you see on this bike. You still get all the great electronics, including cruise control, adjustable traction control, riding modes, adjustable engine braking, um, off-road ABS settings. You get all that. So that base Africa Twin, Honda intends that to be more for people who are gonna use it off-road. It's more of a stripped down, lighter weight version. The Adventure Sports model is a big step up in the features and it's also a step up in price. It's around a $2,800 price increase and brings the price up to $17,199 US. You get a lot of upgrades when you go to the Adventure Sports model. Let me just list them off here real quick so you understand them. You get a six and a half gallon gas tank or around 25 liters. You get a large adjustable windshield. You get heated grips. You get a power accessory socket. You get the amazing cornering lights, which we'll talk about. You get the tubeless rims. And most notably, I think you get Showa's electronically adjustable EERA suspension, which we'll get into in the review, but it's an amazing system. When you go to the Adventure Sports model, you add around 29 pounds or around 13 kilograms of weight. That might sound like a lot, but really if you break down what you're getting, it's not too much additional weight. And I think that's a pretty good compromise. Now, I do want to note that the Adventure Sports does not give you the crash bars, um, luggage racks, things like that. The luggage rack you see here are Honda accessory. They don't come standard on the bike. 
So if you start adding all that stuff, the bike's gonna gain weight and of course you're gonna gain cost. A lot of the marketing photos show the bike with all of the metal crash bars and fog lights and everything, but just keep in mind, it doesn't come with that for the price. Now, if you want Honda's DCT dual clutch transmission, you can add that to either the standard Africa Twin or the Adventure Sports for a $800 price increase and also an increase in weight of about 23 pounds or around uh, 10 kilograms. I have a completely separate video explaining the DCT, who it's for, who it isn't for, the benefits and the drawbacks of it. So I'll link that here and I suggest you go watch that. But if you want to know my opinion, I love the DCT. I think it's a game changer on an adventure bike and I would absolutely get the DCT if it was me. A lot of people want to know about weight. So the bike you see here comes in at 553 pounds wet, ready to ride. Now that's the DCT version. If you don't have the DCT, it's around 530 pounds. Now we'll talk about weight in the comparison sections compared to other bikes, um, but I will say that the bike does not feel top heavy. It feels very well balanced and the weight isn't too bad when you look at all the features and the large gas tank and everything you get with this bike. But we'll talk more about that. Now, as we go through this review, you have to understand, I'm looking at the 2021 model here. The, for 2022, Honda has announced some updates. Um, they have done a few things. They've revised the gearing in the DCT in the, in the first two or three gears. They've shortened the windshield on the Adventure Sports version. They have new graphic schemes. They've added a standard uh, cargo rack to the base bike, uh, whereas before it didn't have that. So they made a few things, but basically it's the same machine. I just wanted you to know that we're talking about the 2021 bike here. So with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and give you a tour of the bike and talk about some of the features. Okay, let's start our tour by just jumping aboard the bike and kind of showing you the seating position. So I always like to mount like this. The Africa Twin, even though it has this big bulbous tank up here, it doesn't feel top heavy. That's the one thing I really appreciate about it. I don't know how they make it so well balanced with such a big fuel tank. Maybe they just centralize the mass. But anyway, you can see I've got the seat actually in the higher of the two positions and I can basically flat foot. I'm five foot 11 inches and I'll convert that here to centimeters for you um, just to give you a sense of that. Um, the bars come back and you can see the seating position is very, very relaxed. Actually, if this was my bike, I would rotate the bars forward. I find them to be a bit too far back. Okay, so coming around to the front of the motorcycle, you can see we've got this large 21 inch front wheel. It's a tubeless wheel and they use the spokes coming out the sides. Um, you've got this low front fender. You've got twin disc brakes, um, four piston calipers on both sides, radially mounted, very good braking system. You can see here the cornering lights as well as the LED high and low beam headlight, um, the LED turn signals, the hand guards, which are a cheap plastic hand guard that are pretty flimsy, uh, the mirrors, um, the side fairings here, you can see the radiators are tucked in nicely here and they're kind of angled towards the front. And then you've got this big adjustable windshield, which as I'm going to mention in other parts of this review, really is too tall, but they fixed that, I know, for the 2022 version. You've got these large upside down forks with, um, of course, the electronic suspension adjustment there. And I think that's about it for the front. Coming around to the right side of the motorcycle, you can see the side fairings here, the tank sticking out here. Uh, this is the dual clutch model, so it does have this extra piece on the engine here with some of the extra um, hoses here for oil and coolant. You can see the Adventure Sports model has this large skid plate with very good coverage and it's actually a pretty nice sturdy skid plate. I'm really impressed for a stock skid plate. That's one of the best I've seen. You've got the brake lever here, um, which you can adjust by changing the position on the shaft. Um, they give you these uh, nice serrated foot pegs, which I think is a nice touch. Moving around here, you've got the passenger pegs here, um, which uh, you can remove. They are removable passenger pegs, so that's a nice thing. And the subframe, it's a detachable subframe, so it's a two-piece frame in case you were ever to damage the rear frame. Um, large exhaust pipe here with dual outlets. And then you've got the luggage racks, which are not standard equipment, but these are optional Honda accessories here, but they're very well made, very sturdy if you do choose to get those. Coming around to the back of the motorcycle here, you can see the rear mud guard, the rear fender, these luggage racks that wrap around the back. LED turn signals, I like how you get LEDs over the whole bike. LED tail light, and this bike has the top case carrier, which is, again, a factory accessory. And then you've got the rear tire. The stock tires on the Africa Twin Adventure Sports are these, uh, I think they're Dunlop Trail Max. They're pretty much a road-oriented tire, maybe like an 80-20 tire. So if you're gonna do much off-roading, you're gonna need to put a knobby tire on there. Coming around to the left side of the motorcycle here, not too much else to mention, except you'll notice there's no shift lever because this is the DCT model. Um, you've got like a toolbox here for storing the tools. That's a nice carryover from the uh, Africa Twin that came out in 2016. I like that they kept that. 
Um, not much else really to talk about. I do think that the side plastics and things are pretty vulnerable, so you'd probably want to put crash bars if this was your personal bike and you were going to take the bike off-road. Of course, the chain drive here, the swing arm, and uh, yeah, that's about it for the tour. So let's go on to the uh, dashboard and the controls. Okay, let's take a look at the controls on the Africa Twin. So let's start here. Um, normal twist grip here that, that you do get heated grips on the Adventure Sports version, which uh, have five level adjustment and they're very effective and they get warm enough, unlike the Tiger 900 I just came off of, which definitely did not get warm enough. You've got adjustable levers on both sides. Um, well, I'm sorry, the DCT model has a parking brake, but if you get the standard shift, you also get an adjustable clutch lever. It does have an adjustable brake lever. Um, you do have this windshield that I've talked about. You have to use two hands to raise and lower it, which is something I don't like. Also for 2022, this is a 21 bike, by the way, for 22, they've cut the windshield down four inches, which was a needed change because this windshield is way too tall. It just doesn't let, allow you to push it low enough. And I don't like the two-sided adjustment. They really should give you a, a method where you can raise and lower with one hand while riding other than this um, two-sided adjustment. You do have a USB port here to connect for charging and also to use the Android Auto or Apple CarPlay. You can see on this model, we've got the um, electronic suspension. So you can see the wires coming out of the top of the fork tubes. You've got kind of a large handlebar riser, which it looks like you can flip around if you want the bars to move a little bit forward. Uh, you've got the lower LCD, which gives you like your speed, your gear position, and I think maybe like the odometer, a few basic things so that if you're waiting for the TFT to boot up, you can still ride away. Then with the TFT, it's the, the TFT is actually really great on this bike. It's a touchscreen, which is one of the only motorcycles with a touchscreen TFT, which is very, very handy. It's very bright. It adjusts the brightness depending on the lighting conditions. You can also manually change the brightness and the contrast. Um, it works very, very well. The only complaint I have is it takes like over 10 seconds, maybe over 15 seconds actually to boot this thing up and get going. Moving around here to the left-hand switch gear, one thing that a lot of people complain about, including myself, is how many buttons are on this switch gear. It takes quite a bit of time with the bike. I've probably ridden between this bike and the previous Africa Twin, the standard 1100 that I had with the same controls. It's probably taken me, oh gosh, at least 500 miles of riding and a lot of hours to really get used to this. But once you get used to all these buttons and what they do, it actually works really, really well. You've got like a favorite button. You've got different menu and function buttons here. You've got a function button on the right handlebars. So you can set up shortcuts for things that you like to do. It's just how the controls are laid out are not intuitive. Like the enter button is on the left instead of on the right. The right button is the back button. So things don't make sense. If you're used to using a computer or a smartphone, it doesn't quite make sense from an intuitive point of view. But again, once you get used to it, it works really, really well. Of course, this being the DCT model, you do get the paddle shifters adding even more buttons to the control stack. And I did want to mention on the right-hand switch gear, you've got your cruise control. I wish the cruise control, I wish it was on the left-hand side, it'd be easier to use, but I don't think they could fit any more buttons over here. You've also got a hazard flasher here. Um, now, since we're here talking about the controls, let's cover the electronic suspension real quick. So how that works on this bike, it's a Showa, EERA electronic suspension adjustment. It's a semi-active suspension, which means it detects what's happening in the road surface and it adjusts as you're riding. But you can also adjust it um, using the control system. So how it, it's set up from Honda is that it's programmed for different um, firmness settings and the different riding modes. Now, the cool thing about it is that, well, first of all, you can adjust the preload. It's a manually adjustable preload, not automatic preload like the BMWs are. So you can manually adjust it for one or two riders and then with luggage or no luggage. So there's really like four or five preload settings. Now moving on past the preload settings, you can also adjust the damping independently front and back um, for soft or harder damping. And that is what sets it apart from like BMW system where it's pretty much just like you get road mode, you know, dynamic pro mode, enduro pro mode, but you can't really tune things front and back how you want. If you go into the user modes and the settings, you can customize exactly um, the damping you want from the front and rear suspension. And also you can configure the preload levels. Like let's say you find that the one rider preload level is is too low for you maybe you're a heavier rider you can change that using the user mode so you can set up user modes one and two not only for all your power levels and engine braking and traction control and all that uh, but you can also set the suspension exactly how you want and that is an amazing thing to be able to to flip through uh, the buttons change your ride modes and have the suspension um, change the damping and change the preload on the fly and it works incredibly well and this is probably the best suspension system on any motorcycle i've ever used just because of how much you can 
can customize it, how you can change it on the fly, and how much um, just how much tuning you can do to it uh, based on what you how the kind of ride you want, which is even a lot more customization than you get on like BMW system. Okay, let's go for a ride on highway with the Africa Twin. We'll hit some twisty roads, put some straightaways, and then of course we'll get into the dirt here in a minute. So firing up the Africa Twin, I've got the ignition on. First, let me show you how long it takes for the screen to boot up because people ask about that. So, see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So I've got the bike in tour mode, uh, which you can configure all these modes. I've talked about that in other parts of this review, but basically in tour mode, I've got the suspension on hard setting, ABS on road, gravel mode off, traction control turned up pretty high, uh, medium engine braking, and the more aggressive power mode. Not all the way, but um, just like the normal road power mode. Suspension preload, one rider. You can see there you can add luggage or a passenger that works really well, and you can change your settings here. So we put the bike into drive because it's a DCT model. Actually, I'm going to put it into sport because I never use the drive setting. If you watch my DCT video, or my other Africa Twin review, the drive setting just shifts so early and it just lugs the bike terribly, so I never use it. But you can see sport mode number two. Actually, uh, the shift points are probably what I would shift in normal riding. It tends to shift like, I don't know, under part throttle around 4,000 RPM or so, which seems to be reasonable. And then the downshifts are, are uh, pretty smooth and pretty, pretty much how I would do them. You can easily take manual control here by using the trigger shifters here on the handlebars. As you can see, third gear, second gear. You can override what the DCT wants to do. Now, after a few seconds of overriding it, it's going to go back and decide again what gear it wants you to be in. But you can see the DCT typically won't shift mid-corner to upset the chassis, so it, it's tends to work pretty well in that regard. So while I'm behind this truck here, let me talk about a few other things. The mirrors, I feel like the mirrors could be out a little bit further. Um, I kind of see my shoulders a little bit, but they're not too bad, they're kind of average. Uh, the windshield, I talked about this before, but it's too tall. This is all the way down and it's still in my line of sight and causing some buffeting. If I raise the windshield up, it just makes the buffeting worse. So I've just found that I have to run it in the low position. The impression you get when you're riding the Africa Twin is just that it's incredibly comfortable and it's incredibly confidence inspiring and it feels good riding slow and it also feels good riding fast. It just does everything very, very well. You sit in a very, very upright position, tons of leg room. Uh, the bars are in a perfect position for, for touring, for riding all day and uh, it just makes you want to go on really long rides. See, in sport mode, it holds the gears pretty well, like I was talking about. And the bike can move along pretty well. It's, um, it's not that fast in this category, you know, with 100 horsepower, but it's, it's not slow either. And you can definitely move along with it. And the uh, good chassis and the good brakes really help with that. For a bike with a 21 inch front wheel, it does very, very well on the highway. Plus you get the benefit of that 21 inch front wheel when you wanna ride off road. And we're already caught back up to traffic, but let me talk about the electronic suspension a little bit, how it works in reality. So the great thing about this, you can change it while you're moving. So I have all the different ride modes kind of set up. So urban mode, the suspension is medium, gravel mode, the suspension is soft. And let's say I switch to gravel mode here on the highway. Um, all of these little like rain grooves or uh, divots in the pavement or sort of uh, uh, you know cracks and the little bumps they seem to disappear now the bike feels like it's floating on a cloud it's not quite as smooth as like my gs is because that has you know the uh, tail lever with a dynamic esa but this is pretty close now if i shift it back to tour mode which I have hard suspension all of a sudden you start feel all the little jiggling again but what you feel is that going through corners you don't have the dive you don't have the wallowing when you put it in that harder suspension mode. 
And like I talked about before, in the user modes, you can customize um, all the damping. Uh, you can customize the damping as much as you want in those user modes, hard or soft, um, to suit uh, how you want to ride it, which is really great. That's something that the BMWs don't have. So see, here's what I like about DCT. The slow speed control is so good. I haven't put my foot down yet. So see how, see how good the slow speed control is? And what I like about DCT is like, when I'm ready to take off here and go, there's no, I'm on a hill, right? Uh, there's no like trying to let the clutch out friction zone, all that. I simply just grab the throttle and go like hell. All of you who really doubt the DCT, you really need to spend more time with the system. It, uh, it's pretty damn impressive. Actually, this whole bike is damn impressive. I can really carve up these twisties. Now, keep in mind, I am on a pretty street-oriented tire, so I'm not being held back by a knobby here. But with the suspension and the firm mode like this, it, it does a very good impression of a sport bike. Now watch, when I get out of these twisties and I start to behave myself a bit more, see, there it goes into fifth gear, and any second, there's sixth gear right there. Let's talk about the brakes for a second. So let me go up to 55, let me go up to 60, and then do a panic stop for you. So the brakes are very, very good. But I just want to show you, like, cruising at 70, like, it's so, the RPMs are so low. It's just a very relaxed experience. If you need to spend a lot of time on the highway doing 75, 80 miles per hour, it's very, very relaxed and comfortable doing that. So yeah, I get a lot of buffeting from this windshield. It's not the greatest, it's not the worst. It's not like a KTM 790 where it just gives you a headache after five minutes, but the problem with the screen is it's too tall and it's too narrow. Like it needs to be wider, but shorter. And I know for the 2022, they have shortened it down, which is a good thing. See here, I've set the cruise control. What you have is an activation button, and then you have this plus minus toggle. I mean, a small complaint, I wish the cruise control was on the left switch gear, just be easier. Show you a, uh, a full throttle acceleration run here. Okay, we're at my usual kind of off-road testing course where I usually film the off-road parts of a lot of my bike tests. So hit a little bit of sand, a little bit of straight roads, got some loops around here. We'll go up this mountain here, hit some ruts and rocks. We'll see how this bike does. Um, starting out off-road, so what I usually do is, I've got the ignition on. So you've got user one and two, which a lot of people will set up maybe user two for how they prefer to ride off-road with different traction control, engine braking power, all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm just going to use the built-in off-road mode for purposes of the video. It puts the suspension damping in soft mode, so it absorbs rocks and things like that. But in the off-road suspension setting, it has more resistance to bottoming. And because it's a semi-active suspension, it kind of detects what's going on and, and reacts to it. And it really helps you out. It makes a huge improvement over the standard bike with the uh, non-electronic suspension. So we've got the power mode here, kind of in the soft power mode. We've got traction control. Oh, you know, one thing I'm going to do is turn traction control... Uh, down here so I can either use the touch screen or I can sorry I can use the touch screen or I can uh, use the handlebar switches but when I'm stopped I find it's pretty easy to use the touch screen and it does work with gloves so I'm going to turn that down to maybe like four so I can get a little bit of slipping there gravel mode is turned on for this off-road mode and again you can configure all this exactly how you want and save it to the user mode which is really really awesome so this system works really really well once you get used to it So I just got, uh, last a couple days ago, I took my 1250 GSA on a pretty long off-road ride. And so that's what I'm coming off of and that's what I've been riding most recently. And jumping on this, it immediately feels just a lot more, uh, a lot more in its element to be doing this kind of riding than the GS. I think it has to do with the lower weight, the chassis, the conventional suspension, the 21 inch front wheel. There's just a lot of things that make it work really, really well. And uh, I have to say, 
like for a big heavy kind of like full-size adventure bike that you can ride across the country on in total comfort this thing absolutely does an extremely good job off-road oh that was a big rock there <laughs> I really like traction control because, um, you know, I can grab the, my throttle and I'm not worried about the bike stepping out too much and I can dial in how much I want. Uh, the standing position is pretty good. I feel, well, these bars need to be rotated forward. I meant to do that, but I ran out of time, but that's something you can just adjust. Um, but the standing position feels really, really natural in the Africa Twin. One small complaint I do have is that the the tank is kind of wide. It, it needs to taper a little bit more. I feel like my uh, my knees are kind of too spread out. Um, that's one thing I have noticed about it. It kind of makes standing up a little awkward in that respect. Your knees feel like they're kind of unnaturally splayed out. The suspension is still on the soft side, even though it has the semi-active suspension. It's still, you can tell the overall spring rates are set up. Um, on the soft side which is pretty much true for every motorcycle it's a common complaint that you know you're all we're always going to see with just about every bike out there especially japanese bikes for some reason and the bike just feels really natural doing this i would be going much slower on my gsa i mean i could probably go as fast on the gs but it would feel like i was just banging the thing to death and it just doesn't like impacts that much with that 19 inch front wheel and a different suspension um, so definitely I give the nod to this over the GS off-road and it carries its weight very very well it doesn't feel awkward or top heavy now I know there's a lot of questions about DCT and I have a dedicated video on the DCT but I just wanted to show you some slow speed maneuvers with it so the trick to using DCT once you learn how to use it it's actually way better than a clutch and here's what I mean so you're gonna grab the rear brake and you're gonna use that to modulate power right so I can do slow speed maneuvers, feed in the power with the throttle as I'm dragging the rear brake. If I let off the rear brake, my speed increases a little bit. But I find it easier than using a clutch because I don't, I mean, this is very, very easy to do these tight U-turns um, with the DCT. I do not wish I had a clutch right now. In fact, I'm very happy that I have the DCT. It just takes a little bit of learning, but then it's totally fine. And then if you want to steer with the throttle, the DCT makes that so easy, uh, easier than with a clutch, I think. So I don't know, I'm not gonna go on about it because there's a lot of disagreement, people don't like it, whatever. Give it a try, uh, have an open mind about the DCT. I find it to be a huge advantage. And if I was buying a Africa Twin or a new adventure bike, I would 100% get the DCT. Let me do kind of another slow speed drill here, but you see how I can feed in just the tiniest bit of power, the tiniest bit of power. Try doing that with a clutch, right? I mean, you can, and then like the slow speed U-turn here, man, that is so easy. I'm just barely feathering the rear brake and feeding in the power very gently. This bike has excellent low speed maneuverability, um, and it really makes me, it makes me want one. Like this bike is, super natural to ride off-road in a way that my GS just isn't as good a bike as that is so yeah let me turn off my lower GoPro here this is how I film this uh, wheel footage here so we'll turn that guy off hopefully that's been capturing and uh, yeah that's my off-road segment for the Africa twin so let's head back to the driveway back to the house and uh, start to wrap up this review So let's talk about how this bike compares to the competition and some differences that you really want to consider when you're shopping for a bike in this category. There's a couple things that I feel make the Africa Twin really stand out from its competitors. The first thing would be the 21 inch front wheel. If you really look at it, there's not many big capacity adventure bikes that come with a 21 inch front wheel. Um, you do have the KTM, the 1290 adventure, but that's a much more expensive, high end, more powerful motorcycle. If you look at something like a Super Tenere, a Multistrada, a GS, a V-Strom, they all come with 19-inch front wheels. And they're just a little bit more road-oriented, whereas this bike gives you a little bit more friendliness for riding off-road. 
The other thing, in my opinion, that makes the Africa Twin so unique and so compelling for some people is that you can get the DCT transmission. Now, that's a whole topic on its own. I know people have mixed opinions about it. As you guys know, I love it. I would buy it. Um, but if you want that, then this is the only game in town. Let's talk about the weight. So I know a lot of people want to compare weights of different bikes. There is a caveat to that, though. Um, the weight that a bike shows on paper on a spec sheet is not necessarily how it feels to ride or even how it feels to push around or get on and off. The Africa Twin has, for me, always felt like a pretty low center of gravity. Even though when you look at it, it looks a bit top heavy, especially with the larger tank on this model, it really doesn't feel top heavy. Getting off and on, riding it, it, it feels very uh, balanced and the weight feels pretty low, which I think is a really big accomplishment for Honda. I'll put a chart up here so you can see how the weight of this bike compares to other bikes in the category. It's definitely not what you would say super lightweight, but if you look at other bikes around the 1200cc mark with all these features, the weight is right about what you would expect. So many people have asked me to compare the Adventure Sports model of the Africa Twin to the BMW 1250GS. So I'm going to do a whole video breaking this out in great detail, so stay tuned for that. That's coming really soon. But here's the short version of it. The GS has more power, more torque, more premium features. It has a tail lever front suspension, which doesn't dive under braking. Um, it's a better road bike. It handles better in the twisties. It has better brakes. It's uh, more engaging to ride on the road. Um, probably a little bit better at carrying passengers is because you have all that extra power and torque, but this is also, I think, very comfortable for that. However, the opposite is true when you go off-road because 136 horsepower of the GS doesn't help you off-road, but what does help you off-road is the 21-inch and 18-inch rear wheel of the Africa Twin. It goes better through rough terrain. The suspension works more naturally. It works better. Um, it has more ground clearance. It just feels like a better bike when you're riding it off-road. The GS is capable off-road, but it feels more like you're kind of tiptoeing through and kind of tractoring through a slower. Whereas this bike, you can hit things pretty hard and carry a pretty good speed. It just feels better off-road. A few other things, the BMW is gonna be more expensive to maintain than the Honda. Uh, it has more specialized parts. Repair cost is gonna be higher on the GS. Of course, also the price of entry is much higher on the GS as well. And I think that's why a lot of people would look at the Africa Twin. If it was my money today, even though I bought a GS, uh, GS Adventure last spring, I would actually buy this. I, pr I think this is a better overall bike, especially when you factor in the money. The other thing that I was surprised by is that the cornering lights on this Honda actually work better than the adaptive headlight on my 21GS. That was a big surprise, so that's something to keep in mind as well. What about the Yamaha Super Tenor A1200? So that bike's been out for a long time and it has a great reputation of lasting forever and being super comfortable and a super good performer. Here's the differences between the Super Tenere and the Africa Twin. The Super Tenere is quite a bit heavier and it's more top heavy. It doesn't feel as light or as nimble as this bike. Um, also, you're down to, again to that 19 inch front wheel. You have less suspension travel, less ground clearance. It's just not as well engineered for going in actual off-road situations as the Africa Twin is. I think for touring, because you have the shaft drive, you have a bit more power and torque. Um, it might be a little bit better for touring, but not much better than this. Wind protection is, I think, pretty similar. Uh, the Africa Twin is a more modern, updated platform since this bike is new for 2020 with all the updates. The Super Tenere is getting pretty long in the tooth, but you do get electronic suspension on both bikes, so that's nice that you get that on both bikes. But for me, the Africa Twin is going to win every single day just because the Super Tenere, and I did used to own one, just feels very, very heavy to me. What about the Tiger 900 Rally? So that is something you should definitely be comparing to this. Now, the Tiger doesn't come in like the sort of adventure version light with the larger tank and the stuff like this Adventure Sports Africa Twin does. But here's the thing about the Tiger. Uh, the Tiger, even though it has a little less power on paper and a smaller engine, it feels pretty much just as fast as this bike. The suspension is excellent, although it's only manual adjustments instead of electronic. Um, I think for, you know, the weight is less on the Tiger, so it's going to be a little bit better off-road. It does, it does feel a little more nimble off-road than this bike, although the Africa Twin does very well. I think if you're going to ride like two up, like uh, go touring with a passenger, the extra sort of capacity and maybe a little bit the extra size of the Africa Twin might help you there. 
But as an all-around adventure bike, that Tiger 900 Rally is super, super hard to beat. It has amazing wind protection, it has great technology, it has great comfort. There's really not much to complain about on that bike. And I think you should that should be very, very high on your list if you're looking for a bike in this category. And don't let the smaller engine fool you into thinking that it's like not as fast. It's, it's as fast as this 1100 Africa Twin. A lot of people want to compare this bike to something like a KTM 890 or maybe a Tenere 700 or a smaller adventure bike. That's really not an apples to apples comparison because you're going down one whole size class to a mid-size adventure bike. The Africa Twins, in my experience, having owned them and ridden them and tested them, the Africa Twins feel one big step up heavier and more cumbersome and larger than those mid-weight bikes. So this does not compare in any way off-road to something like an 890 Adventure R or even a Tenere 700. This feels quite a bit heavier. Um, it's a lot more work to ride off-road. You won't take it into the same technical situations with as much ease as you would something like an 890 or a T7 or one of those smaller bikes. So not really an apples to apples comparison there. This is gonna be better for long touring. It's more relaxed on the highway. The RPMs are lower. It's better for carrying a passenger. You have more features and tech. So you're gonna have to make a choice there based on how you like to ride. Okay, so this is the part of the video where I answer questions from you, from the viewers. So I asked for questions on social media and on YouTube and you guys sent in a lot of good questions. So let me go through the ones I selected here. I'll try to cover most of the ones you guys sent in. And we'll try to get through this quickly so we don't take forever. Um, so Kyle Rust asks, thoughts on the DCT and is it worth $5,000 over the Tenere 700? Well, the DCT, I love it. I have a whole video on that, so go watch that. I would buy the DCT if it was me. It makes the bike easier to ride in low speed situations. You don't stall, you don't tip over and fall over like is so common on big heavy adventure bikes. Is it worth more than a T7? Well, it has more features, it has a bigger engine, it's a more touring oriented bike. If you're gonna carry a passenger and a ton of cargo or go on super long trips on the highway at high speeds, then yeah, it's worth paying more to get the Africa Twin, but you're giving up that nimbleness, that lightweight feeling off-road and the simplicity that the T7 offers. So it just depends on how you're using the bike. Is it worth the extra money? Yeah, if you're using that extra capability and you need the larger size of the Africa Twin. Todd asks, are you able to easily loft the front wheel a bit to cross obstacles? I don't see why you couldn't. I mean, it's a big heavy bike, so it's gonna be a challenge to do that. You're gonna to have to put the DCT in manual mode and also engage the G mode. So the G mode um, makes the, uh, it just um, has less slip in the transmission in G mode. And you're gonna to have to manually control the gear so it doesn't like upshift and get you out of the power band. But yeah, I think you could, just like you could on a manual bike, but you're gonna to have to use a lot of technique because it's a big heavy bike. Glenn Brown asks, would the Africa Twin DCT be a good beginner's bike? Um, no, I don't think so. Like this is the large, heavy, tall, uh, powerful motorcycle. So I would never recommend something like this for a beginner. Uh, if you do want a beginner bike, Honda makes a lot of good offerings in the lower capacity bikes. Um, whether you start off with DCT or not, I mean, my thought is that everyone should learn to ride a manual shift bike and learn to use a clutch and then graduate to DCT later on but that's just my opinion. So Mitch Templeton asks, can you explain the G mode? When is it useful on the DCT? That's his first question. Um, the G mode just locks up the gears faster. It has less slip. So it's something that is useful off road, um, like when you're trying to get power right away. He also asks, should the ABS and traction control be turned off in the off-road or gravel settings? Well, you can set up what you want um, in, the, in the custom ride modes, but uh, the ABS has like three modes. It has on, it has off-road mode, which is less intervention, but the ABS is still on on both wheels. And then you can cancel the rear ABS, but you have to do that manually each time, no matter what mode you're in. And you can't set that as a default. So you're gonna have, if you want that rear ABS turned off, you're gonna have to um, sit there with the TFT and do that every single time, which is a little bit annoying. He also goes on to say that the touchscreen is a 2400R part that alone can justify an extended warranty. Um, yeah, so that's something that we should keep in mind. Thanks, thanks for the info. That's good info to have. Uh, really enjoy your content. Oh, thank you for that. Thanks, thanks, Mitch. Um, Gene Clark says, the common complaint is the DCT shifts way too early with every mode and you have to revert to the paddle shifters. Um, yeah, I would say that's true for the most part. However, in sport modes two and three, it shifts pretty well. Um, in drive mode or in sport one, it does shift way too early. What I do, sometimes I just override the shifter with the click buttons on the handlebar or I just use manual mode. But for the most part, when I ride around normally, I like to ride in sport mode too and I find the shift points to be very, very good. 
Oh, he says also covered DCT and engine braking. So engine braking is really strong on this bike. You can actually adjust the engine braking in the computer, which is really cool. Um, the DCT, uh, it, may, it may be in a higher gear than you might want for engine braking. And if it is, you can just hit the paddle shifter to downshift it. But again, those sport modes help out in that situation. Big Tech says, is the lack of weight size a disadvantage compared to the GS? The GS looks massive in comparison, but I don't really know. Okay, um, is it a disadvantage? No, I, I think um, it's an advantage really because having less weight and less bulk is a good thing. That The GS and the GSA are almost too big in some ways. Um, this is just a stable on the highway. Uh, it's 90% as good for touring. Like I mentioned, it's not quite as good a sport bike, but no, I would say the size of this is, is a bit better than something like a GSA. Okay, so Mr. Grumble 072 asks, as a handful of content creators that I value the opinion of, oh, thank you for saying that. He says, I'm very keen to hear your thoughts on the electronic suspension. Your view may influence whether I purchase the Africa Twin um, in the new year with or without it. Uh, with the ES fitted, does it prevent aftermarket suspension upgrades? And then he goes on to talk about, you know, what about repairing the suspension down the line? So um, the first question is, I love the electronic suspension. It works very, very well. It reacts to the road surface. You can customize it in the settings, just how you want it set up. And I think it's actually better than the BMW system. So that's saying a lot. Now, in terms of like repairing down the line or customizing it, I'm still researching that. I wasn't able to get really clear answers on that, but I'm gonna write an email to Honda and I'll post up here in the video description or the comments once I find that out. But that's a very, very important question because you wanna be able to service the bike or change the springs or do things like that as the bike gets higher mileage. And I'm not sure how much more complicated that would be with the Showa electronic suspension system. So good question. Andrew Atkinson says, um, I'm eagerly anticipating this review because this bike has a hold on me. I want you to know what you think of the electronic suspension, if the DCT is worth it. Um, I find the one, two, three gearing too short in the manual versions with too much clutch and busy work. So I find myself going to the dark DCT side. Yeah, um, so I've covered the electronic suspension. The DCT, uh, I mean, try it, you know, do some demo rides if you can. Personally, I'm in love with a DCT. I would, I would buy this bike with a DCT in a heartbeat. And I, uh, I agree with you. I don't like all the clutch work when you're in stop and go traffic. I don't find it to be a benefit at all. And uh, the DCT isn't the dark side. It's actually just the enlightened side. So that's my opinion. Greg Cook says, uh, Please compare on-road freeway wind protection between this, the GSA, the Versus 1000. So uh, this is not as good a wind protection as the GSA or the Versus 1000. It's, it's okay. Uh, you could change the windshield. The windshield I find is too narrow and too tall and the fairing is not quite wide enough also in the lower part. It doesn't protect you like the GSA does or the Versus, uh, but it's decent and you could definitely do long trips on it. So Jeffrey Kruger says, coming from the perspective of a guy who can realistically just have one bike, how does this stack up to the standard Africa Twin, the GSA, and the T7 as an all-rounder? I have to slab 100 miles to get to any dirt. Oh, that's a tough question. I think for most people, as, a one, as an all-round bike, the GSA is just too big and heavy. And I say that as somebody who has a GSA. Um, the T7 is smaller, more nimble. It doesn't have the technology or the comfort or the highway kind of cruise factor that this bike does. I mean, it's really tough. Money also comes into play too there. Uh, the Africa Twin is very, very good for an all-rounder if you want to do long highway trips and you still want to go pretty good in the dirt. If you're just doing gravel roads or easy fire roads, then the Africa Twin is more than enough. If you're doing like more technical riding, like some of the hard sections on the BDRs or single track or stuff like that, then the Africa Twin starts to feel really big and the T7 comes into play there. So really hard to answer that. It just depends on how you want to ride. I think you'd be happy with either the Africa Twin or the Tenere 700, but I think the GSA is probably too big for what you're talking about. Alex M says, if I can't afford a GS, is the ATAS a solid choice for 80% sport touring, 20% off-road? Yes, and I think I've covered that in this review. It definitely is. SP3 says, I have a 2018 DCT and I'm thinking of changing. Uh, he says the suspension is too soft, there's too much rear sag, power is also too low. Do you think the 1100 with ES would cure these problems? Yes. If you have a 1000 Africa Twin, this engine has way, way more punch, more power. The electronic suspension will cure your issues because you can adjust it 
um, however much you want. The preload settings, the electronic preload settings, you can feel the bike going up and down when you press those buttons. It works really, really well. So yes, 100% I'd recommend um, going with this. If you like Africa Twins, you're going to be super impressed with this bike. So final thoughts on the Honda Africa Twin 1100 ES DCT Adventure Sports. I know, it's a long name. At the beginning of the review, I asked the question, with all of the upgrades and tech and features that the Adventure Sports version has, does that bring it up to the level to compete with the other premium high-end adventure bikes, which I thought the base level Africa Twin definitely did not? Um, and my answer is a resounding yes, and I think I've really explained that in this video. The Africa Twin 1100, despite being a little bit down on horsepower and torque compared to some of the other high-end adventure bikes like KTM and BMW and Ducati, it has everything you need for an all-around, heavyweight, long-distance adventure bike that's extremely off-road capable because it's got that nice 21-inch front wheel. When you add things in like the electronic suspension, which does an amazing job of coping with changing terrain, changing loads, passengers, luggage, things like that, and the customization, when you add in the adjustable windshield, the amazing cornering lights, uh, the other comfort and technology that this bike offers, I think it's an extremely, extremely compelling package. And for me, 100 horsepower is enough. Like I don't need that extra 30 horsepower that the GS1250 has. And so this bike is very, very compelling for somebody like me. I also like the fact that the six and a half gallon tank on this bike is like the perfect size because the GSA with 7.9 gallons is overkill. I don't need eight gallons of gas. But on the other hand, the standard GF with, with like 5.2 gallons, it's a little bit too small for me. So 6.5, they nailed it on the gas tank size on this. So that's just another um, sort of check checkbox here for this bike. If I was buying a heavyweight adventure bike today after everything I've tested and everything I've owned, I would buy this and I'd get the 2022 because they brought back the tricolor models. I don't like the black and silver, but that's just me. I would go for the like the red, white, and blue color. I think it's just gorgeous. And I would totally, and I'm even thinking of ordering that bike because I like this bike so much. And I find DCT takes so much of the stress out of riding and makes slow speed control on a heavy bike so much better. I mean, there's a reason that dirt bikers use recluse clutches, but then people complain about the DCT on the Africa Twin. I don't get it. Like, it's the same idea as that. You don't stall, you don't fall over. The DCT is awesome, and I would love to have it on my adventure bike. So I haven't mentioned too many negatives in this review because it's really hard to find anything bad to say about this package. Honda has really refined this bike over the years and they've really addressed just about all my complaints. I mean, if I wanna nitpick, yeah, the controls are not intuitive. They take a long time to learn to use, but when you do, they're very good. I don't like the boot up time on the TFT, but we beat that to death. I don't like the windshield, but I think they fixed that on the 2022 model. Um, but there's really, there's just not much to complain about. So at just over $17,000, if you opt not to get the DCT, I think this is probably, no, it definitely is the best value for a heavyweight full-size adventure bike, considering its capabilities, its comfort, its feature, its technology. And of course you get the Honda reputation for durability and reliability and resale value that um, they've really earned that. And you know, it's, it's something that you still have in this bike. I hope you really found this review useful. If so, please do all the normal things, like, subscribe, hit the bell, uh, support me on Patreon. You can buy my merchandise, um, do all those things. I really appreciate you guys being along for the ride with me. This is an amazing journey to grow this channel. Thank you so much. I hope the review was useful. If you have further questions, comments about this bike, let me know in the comments below and we'll address them. Uh, thanks for all your participation. Thanks for being part of this community. Uh, ride safe and we'll see you soon.